it's always good to have the young with us as we reminisce on the past. I'm seeing quite a number of colleagues, visitors, who are here for St. Patrick's, um, the St. Patrick's Week of Celebrations. Welcome to Montserrat and welcome to this annual lecture. It is with great pleasure that I'm welcoming you because this is an occasion, a significant occasion in the life of Montserrat and in the life of the universities here in Montserrat. Professor George Irish, in further perspectives for Aliogana, says March 17 is important for us because on that day in 1768, Negro slaves, along with Negro and mulatto freedmen, joined forces to attempt to overthrow the white colonial government on Aliogana. As you know, Aliogana is Montserrat's Amerindian name. He goes on to say that whereas in 1678, there were 2,682 whites and only 992 Negro slaves, by 1768, there were only about 1,320 whites and over 10,000 blacks on Montserrat. Recognizing their numerical strength, the Montserrat Negroes in 1768 went, went, went straight for the seat of power. They wanted to trap all the whites at a party at Government House on the night of March 17 and take over the government once and for all. In explaining the background to our celebrations around March 17, he says that up to 1768, March 17 was a traditional festive day on this island, but for strictly foreign reasons. After 1768, it assumed intrinsic, historic, local significance, stifled by Anglo-Irish colonialism for exactly 200 years. The doorway to the past was broken open in December 1968 at the MSS speech day. He apparently spoke on the topic change and called for national consciousness. The pathway to the past was trodden four years later, that's in 1972, for the first time. The Montserrat Secondary School staged an impressive Know Your Past program to celebrate March 17th. Even before those 1972 celebrations, on March 20th, 1971, the Montserrat Mirror, the local newspaper, published an article by Howard A. Fergus entitled, March 17th May Become a National Day. We're talking about 1971. And since Professor Sir Howard seems to have an uncanny ability to predict the future, I will certainly check with him later about my prospects. <laughs> in this article in 1971, Sir Howard, who was then Chief Education Officer, explains that Wednesday of this past week mark, marked the 203rd anniversary of the greatest plot on the part of slaves of Montserrat to overthrow their oppressors. On the 17th of March, 1768, 23 years before Toussaint led his famous revolt in Haiti, a serious rebellion was planned here. Unfortunately, it was Scotch when the plot was uncovered by a woman who overheard some of the discussions. The day, St. Patrick's Day, was ideally chosen since the planter lords of Irish Montserrat would have been commemorating St. Patrick's Day. The slaves within government house were to have secured the swords of the gentlemen, while the rest of the faction were to fire into the house from without. Included in this conspiracy were Negroes, mulattoes, freed slaves. This indicated an unusual solidarity among these underprivileged groups. The victims were, however, cruelly executed. Sir Howard went on to say that, unfortunately, none of the names of these worthy sons have come down to us, but I wish nevertheless to pay them tribute and to salute them as martyrs of freedom and precursors of black freedom fighters. The 17th of March may become a national day. Over the years, Professor Sir Howard and others kept the agenda of March 17 and Montserratian freedom fighters alive. In the UE, University of the West Indies, sorry, those of us who are accustomed to it, rattle off the acronym. The University of the West Indies Department of Extramural Studies, in its 1978-1979 annual report, the then resident tutor Howard Fergus reports that the celebration of St. Patrick's Day 
is now an annual cultural feature of the University Center. He went on to say that this year, all our center-based or related groups combined in a cultural show of drama, songs of struggle, patriotism and hope, and poetry presentations. Most of the material was locally created. The play, Hard Times, was written by Montserrat Theatre Group Secretary, Vereen Thomas, and the singers were prepared by Mistress Edith Bellot Allen. The resident tutor read some of his poems. And it's important to note this, the St. Patrick's Day program was restaged later in St. John's, a rural district. By 1983, Governor Kenneth Hay Dale, on the advice of the Executive Council, appointed the 17th day of March, 1983, St. Patrick's Day, as a public holiday throughout the colony. And in 1984, the schedule of the Public Holidays Act was amended to include St. Patrick's Day, being the 17th day of March. I decided to share all this information for a number of reasons. Montreal has been through unprecedented change. We have witnessed the impact of forced migration, including the loss of personal and public records. However, there really is no excuse for us to always assume that the vacuum created by these losses makes us all trailblazers. It does not at all expunge the historical record and where documents have disappeared, there is value in oral histories and shared memories. So please note that in fact, there have been previous opening ceremonies for the St. Patrick's celebration. In fact, Sir Howard spoke on the meaning of St. Patrick's Day for Montserrat at the opening ceremony for the March 17, 1992 celebrations. And the celebrations were not always held in St. Patrick's prior to 1995 but can be said to have originated at the University Center in Plymouth. I thank you. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to the person who's gonna chair the proceedings from now on. And I'd like to just introduce him very briefly. The Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Housing and the Environment. The Honorable Mr. Claude Hogan, who sees himself as an avid sportsman, an economist, a global consultant, and a regional integrationist. <laughs> His academic achievements include first class honors at Keene University in New Jersey, international diplomacy studies at Harvard, and a master's in trade and economic law from the University of London. He has done postgraduate work at the International Development Bank and the World Trade Organization. He has over 25 years of professional experience working with the Department for International Development, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, the European Union, and the United Nations system. He has worked in a variety of high profile positions. He's been a CARICOM diplomat, a project manager, a university lecturer, and he has been before and is currently now a member of the Legislative Assembly. I welcome the Honorable Claude Hogan to the podium. Normally, this would be Mr. Willock's podium, as it's in the area of culture, but also it is an intellectual um, presentation. And I'm here by invitation, if only because I've known Professor Dr. Clarice Barnes forever. She was my teacher at Monster Secondary School. Uh, in, hi in history, which I've still retained a lot of that in my head, uh, notwithstanding what I've further gathered from my fellow countryman, Sir Howard Fergus. And I was honored to be invited because she, I considered to be uh, one of my spiritual healers. And that's a long story, but that's during school time. And I've also grown up long enough to have worked alongside her as a warrior for Montserrat. I can recall, and it's reflected in what I've been given to present, but I needed to say something myself. I can recall in the corridors of the House of Commons in England, at the height of the volcanic crisis, when we waged war hand in hand on the question of the survivability 
and sustainability of Montserrat to ministers of the British government. And I believe we were on that crucial point of whether there would be a cultural genocide if Montserrat was allowed to go with the wind of the volcano. Thank you, Dr. Pans, who have had me even at that young age next to you, pretending to be a warrior at the time. I'm going full-blooded, but she was wise leadership at the time for me. I want to thank you for that. And of course, I need to pay tribute to Sir Howard Fergus, who is fast approaching being Montserrat's first living hero, if I might say so myself, or perhaps I'm signaling somebody. Lastly, I wanted to say, I've always wondered why they thought, or what is the analogy, that it's a woman who betrayed the slave uprising of 17 March. It's some analogy, or is it a fact? And I'm not sure. And then I've wondered, well, which woman would have done that? Or maybe I should say, whose woman would have done that? But we'll probably hear some of those answers tonight. But in everything you read in history, not necessarily the, the language is not necessarily 100% um, what it is intended to at first glance, but you have to read behind the script of what is hidden there. And I'm sure we have an expert at that uh, in Professor Barnes. I want to use the occasion to encourage young people to study history. Last year, the University of West Indies did a study and they came up with the fact that um, your level of economic activity and your appreciation of your own national endowments has a lot of correlation with the level of education in your community. And they offer the entire Caribbean, including Montserrat, an opportunity to send students to the university to pursue PhD level studies to increase the capacity of intellectual value because it has a strong correlation with how far, how fast, and how powerful is your economic development. So I want young people to see education as that important and critical. And of course, we have had the leftover of people being left out of education opportunities because some people say, oh, you're too old. Well, that has gone out of the window. Last year, we have proven that with Dan Phil Morris, that you can, you, if you're entering a certain field for the first time at a particular age, it might, be an inhibit, it, might be, it might inhibit you because they'll say you don't have time to grasp the fundamentals. But once you have the experience and you've been in it for a while, there's always the opportunity to get to the PhD level no matter what age because it's called self-improvement to put more into your own self-development and hence your own economy. So we must not see age as, uh, and education as limited to age, but it's about where you are in the cycle of your life. I want to encourage that. Professor Barnes has been an educator for over 40 years. She has contributed to formal and non-formal education in Montserrat, in the wider Caribbean and the UK, and in Africa. Her work on the psychosocial effects of Hurricane Hugo in 1989 led her into the field of gender and disaster. In this regard, she initiated counseling programs on behalf of the University of West Indies uh, Women and Development Unit, then called WAND, and produced a video entitled, I Saw the Wind, which was premiered at a disaster conference for eminent women of the Caribbean. The video was later purchased by PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, and used in disaster education across the region. The eruptions at the Sufre Hills volcano provided Dr. Barnes with further experiences in this field. As early as the second month of the eruption, she, she self-financed a disaster counseling training workshop for community leaders. Later, she coordinated similar workshops for women, children, churches, uh, with the support of the re-evaluation community of Trinidad and the Montreal Christian Council. Government departments, Monlec, Water Authority, and the Bank of Montreal also engaged her in facilitating workshops. When evacuations happened, she walked the streets, or perhaps that you say when relocations happened, she walked the streets and visited the shelters and counseled at the shelters across Montserrat. This voluntary work was acknowledged in regional and international media where she was referred to as the healer across the line. 
1997 to 2000, Dr. Barnes successfully pursued a PhD at the University of Birmingham based on her experiences in the field here in Montserrat and with the voluntary persons evacuated to the United Kingdom. Her thesis entitled The Montserrat Volcano, A Study of Meaning, Psychosocial Effects, Coping and Intervention is regarded as very valuable to disaster studies and humanitarian education. She has produced several papers since and book chapters from this work. Also, she has also presented at many conferences regionally and internationally to include the Volcano World Conference in Ecuador in 2006, where her paper entitled Psychosocial Effects of the Montserrat Volcano and Coping, Some Reflections 10 Years On, which revealed important insights into handling the human aspects of responding to these tragedies. Another contribution of Dr. Barnes's was as a team leader of the Montserrat Project in Birmingham, guiding the resettlement of evacuees in the Midlands. During this period, she organized a mass healing service post the June 26 eruption. She spoke in the House of Commons about the psychosocial effects. She advocated for higher education opportunities for the evacuees and this resulted in the Montserrat Education Award Scheme. And was, she was also at the same time helping students to get access to those scholarships. She served during that time as a patron of the Montserrat Volcano Fund in the UK. Additionally, she started to lecture on the same topic to disaster managers from West African countries at the Pan-African Institute of Development in Cameroon. Whilst there, she made field visits to communities near the erupting Mount Cameroon, similar to the one at Mount Catapaxi in Ecuador. Recently, she was engaged as a professor of education at the William V. Tubman University, where she worked with students traumatized by war. Finally, Dr. Barnes is a cultural activist who was one of the architects of the Montserrat cultural policy, and she dances masquerade. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that gives you a mix of what we'll have now from Dr. Professor Dr. Clarice Barnes. Let me begin by thanking the Honorable Claude Hogan, my student, and warrior friend for introducing me in such a sensitive and uh, I'm lost for word for the next thing, but a sensitive and I would say sincere way. I regard it as a distinct a privilege to present this lecture this evening. And many people have met me and congratulated me for being chosen to present the lecture. What I didn't say to them is that I was not chosen. I actually asked. And the reason why I was not chosen was that 28 years ago, I actually presented this lecture. And I want to thank Professor Sir Howard Fergus for cajoling me into doing that lecture on that occasion. I was a young thing and couldn't understand why he wanted to do this thing that was so nerve wracking. I now recognize that he saw something that I did not. And this was providing me an opportunity to take that journey in academia. So I would like to thank him very much and thank the University of the West Indies for all the opportunities that provided, they, that it provided, that brought me into the field of disaster and development. And so tonight, 
I've decided to speak on the topic, Volcano at 20, discerning shifting rhythms and beat. And the reason why I asked is because it is 20 years and I thought that I had something to say. And I would think that if I was chosen 28 years ago, that by now I would be empowered enough to seek out opportunities for myself. So I want to thank Grace for actually saying yes. In fact, she was very pleased that I, I asked and have supported my preparation for this lecture. And so I came up with this topic and then I would say that the topic became a burden to me because you know, to figure out exactly what to include under this heading was not easy. I thought that in the midst of all the celebrations that we are having, that you would really want to come and hear a lecture that is filled of psychological terms and, you know, filled with the vocabulary of stress and post-traumatic stress and so forth. So, Whatever I present to you tonight is a creative attempt at telling you some of that, but at the same time providing a little light um, insight into the connection between culture and our um, psychological well-being. So let me begin doing that right now. And don't laugh. I thought that if I'm talking about discerning rhythm and beat, I can't do that unless I take something from the arrow. So I'm going to do a little thing, if I could manage it. Boom, ba dum boom, ba dum Boom, ba dum boom, boom. Boom, ba dum boom, ba dum Could you hear the volcano? Boom ba dum boom ba dum, boom ba dum boom boom. I wailing, I dancing to the rhythm and the beat. Boom ba dum boom ba dum. The aim of this lecture is to explore the catastrophic in the lives of monstrations from 20 years of living with a volcanic eruption utilizing embodied history of slavery, music, and dance to analyze assumptions about traumatization, coping, and resilience, and noting implications for future development. And from here on, I'm going to be drumming up the context because, of course, I gave you already boom ba dum boom ba dum Boom, ba dum, boom, boom. When the drummers change their beat, the dancers must also change their step. And this is an African proverb which I thought was, is very appropriate for this discussion. Because since 1995, and I'm going to call it as people do, the volcano. The volcano is the number one drummer in Montserrat life. Since 1995, the volcano, because that's what we call it, the volcano, is the number one drummer in Montserrat life. The volcano is our greatest ancestor, the most elevated family member who has witnessed our suffering for nearly 400 years. The volcano feeds us from lush hillsides, yet snatches our food away. The volcano in unites us, yet separates us. The volcano displaces, yet it shelters. The volcano witness our comings as Africans on slave ships as indentured Irish or runaways from religious oppression. The volcano is our rhythm, 
and beat, our heartbeat, apparently benign as the greeting march of the masquerade, but as explosive as the number four. The, dump, the, the, the volcano is us. And so I'm positioning the volcano as a drum and as a drummer. And I think that is an important part of drumming up a context where the drum was banned during the period of our enslavement. As early as the 18th century, the Caribbean colonialists regard it as a main artery of rebellion, drumming and dancing. So drumming and dancing, well, dancing were not allowed, on, except under stringent circumstances, which included Christmas and other religious holidays when a boom drum was used. And that gives us a, a little insight into why Christmas is so regarded and there's so much music around that time. Almost in contradiction of the prohib prohibition, at least at the plantation level it was prohibited, but on the slave ships, our ancestors, African ancestors, enslaved Africans, were forced to dance and sing on the deck of the ships as a form of exercise and were whipped if they showed reluctance or insufficient agility. And here you have an, an uh, image of that from the French maritime collection. There's an image of the slave ship and the dreadful conditions under which our ancestors were brought to these shores. And in drumming up the context, I'm going to return again to Arrow, because Arrow tells us that man and woman must live. He didn't put in the woman thing, but I think that if he, if he was writing it now, he would. So man and woman must live. He reminds us that ever since humans have been inflicting violence on other humans, they have been devising techniques to deal with its after effects, which also holds true for so-called natural disasters. So whatever happens, we know that we are survivors. The volcano knows that too. And we can confirm this as a result of what has happened with us over the last 20 years. Yet we continue to ask the questions, what do we do about the catastrophic in our lives? Despite what Arrow has said, beside, beside that rhythm and beat that he established in Man Must Live, we continue to ask, what do we do about the catastrophic in our lives? Are we coping? Are we resilient? Are we in need of healing? So then I decided to look at some rhythms of catastrophe. And I think the first rhythm of catastrophe that our volcano knows about, that great mountain, is African enslavement. And I mentioned before that it witnessed the coming of the African people here. Another rhythm of catastrophe is the March 17th uprising of St. Patrick's Day, 1768. Our post-emancipation suffering, I also position as a rhythm of catastrophe. And then the natural disaster which we which includes the volcanic eruption that we are now speaking of. So that is the listing of catastrophes that I have decided to, to bring to your attention as we consider what do we do about the catastrophic in our lives. Just as a symbol of enslavement, I have included the shackles that bind us 
for hundreds of years. And as we are now are aware that the, any taking away of freedom leads to consequences that affect us psychologically, I'm putting those shackles in for us to remember the difficulties of enslavement that are still very much present in our understanding of life and survival. And another, um, looking at the rhythm of catastrophe of March 1768, I went all the way to Jamaica, and I think that I'm at liberty to do this because we are one Caribbean, and got an image from the Jamaica Dance Theatre that um, was led by Professor Rex Nettleford, deceased. And we are seeing there the warrior spirit falling as a result. We are now updated to the volcanic eruption, July 1995 and its beginnings, and this became one of the most iconic images of that time. We grew up on this island, those of us who lived before the eruption, and we were, we, I, I, well, I was not taught, and most people say they weren't taught that we had a volcano. We knew we had something called Sufres, and uh, we made visits to them, and we thought them benign. In fact, my grandfather had a big argument with me because I mentioned that we had a volcano in Montserrat. This was before the eruption. And he said that he was taught that a volcano is a fiery mountain. We have no fiery mountain in Montserrat, so we have no volcano. Of course, the fire was there on the mountain all the time. Sometimes we interpreted that fire as jack-o'-lanterns. Could you remember that? Fire rolling down the mountain, jack-o'-lanterns that we were scared of. And uh, later we might say that that was influenced by the Irish presence here, that description of it. But by 1995, there were no jack-o'-lanterns. We had full, <laughs> we have full flown, flowing, rising act, um, examples of what the volcano was about. A scary realization that the peaceful environment that we live in is no longer peaceful. Shattered assumptions about safety that were brought about by that eruption starting in July 1995. In the beginnings of it, we were running scared. We knew very little. We didn't understand much of what was happening. And uh, we, t we, we managed, though. we coped um, with all this newness because this, these are new environmental features. But as we progressed and we experienced more, we, as the rhythms change and as the beats change, as produced by the volcano, we reached the point where sometimes it was unbearable, especially when we start losing our houses. Very proud we were of the homes that we had and of the communities that we had, and then we had to experience this. Church, people as we are, this image is a very frightening image that tells us that even the places that we think are most protected by God can actually disappear too. So this reinforces what I'm saying, that the volcano stands as the most important power within the island. So there were losses, incalculable losses. But the beat went on and we continued to survive, just as Arrow say, man and women must live despite. But there came a time when some people made decisions to move on because the rhythm and beat became too confusing to deal with. Now this, um, from providing those images, I am now going to speak about coping. The losses that we had, incalculable as they were, 
both at the physical and, hum the, and human, the physical, environmental, and human levels, challenged us to do something about them. The volcano did its drum beat. It dictated the rhythm, it dictated the beat, and we had to do something about it. People famous for their understanding of stress and coping, Lazarus and Folkman being um, two of the most outstanding in this area, has divided um, coping into two. There's problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. And we are going to see that in responding to the shifting rhythms and beat of the volcano, that our people did both. They engaged in problem-focused co um, coping, and they engaged in emotion-focused coping. So when you are coping in a problem-focused way, you target the cause of the stress in practical ways. So the people who were evacuating sat down, they thought about it, or probably in some instances, somebody else helped them to think about it and make the decision, and they moved on. That was a problem-focused way of coping. Okay? Um, when you do that, when you think about what is happening and you decide to move yourself away from the stress, oh, then you are actually solving the situation. Problem focus, calm, coping, therefore, involved in taking control or changing the relationship between yourself and the source of the stress. Um, and I gave the example of the evacuation. Problem focus um, coping also involve a cognitive response to the stressor. And the most, it's the most rational action that you can take. You find out information about it, uh, you try to understand the situation, and then you are able to put in the strategies that would help you to avoid whatever the stress, distressing situation is. So problem-focused um, coping is about evaluating the pros and cons of different options for dealing with the stressor. So we evacuated, first of all, internally from south to north, from east to north, and then eventually overseas, all over the Caribbean, and so on. And when we were in the throes of that, we might not have, we might not have recognized it as a coping mechanism. Sometimes we thought we were forced to do so. But whether we were forced or not, it is still a way of coping. The other aspect of coping is emotion-focused coping. And they claim that this is not an, as efficient a way of coping as the problem-solving way. So emotion-focused coping involves trying to reduce the negative emotional responses associated with stress, such as embarrassment, fear, anxiety, embar um, depression, um, frustration. But at times, this might be the only realistic option when the source of the stress is outside of your control. So there was a time at the height of the crisis when we were walking around telling stories, telling jokes, um, doing things that, you know, are making light of the situation. And that was because we regarded, we knew instinctly that that was a way of coping. So looking at, a little, looking at it a little deeper, um, emotion-focused um, coping strategies include keeping yourself busy to take your mind off the issue. And it, at the highest of the crisis, many of us were going around in a manic way doing all sorts of things. I think that's the reason why that I, I got into the research that I got into. Because from morning till night, I was up and down on the streets, in the shelters, as a volunteer, listening to other people's stories. And many of us 
coped in that way at that time. Um, then, letting off steam. Letting off steam, sometimes we are cursing out people and we don't even realize what. There was a lot of you know, petty squabbles in the shelters and so on. And that was part of it was, apart from the, the confined and uncomfortable circumstances under which some of us had to live, it was again about letting off steam, getting angry because we are stressed by the situation. And then there was a lot of praying for guidance and strength. I used to go to an early morning prayer meeting at um, the Pentecostal church on the hill. And um, we were there early, nearly every morning, and the mountain was blazing behind us, and we were praying, you know, that God will, will control it. And, um, and even on the morning of the last, the last morning that we had in Plymouth, when the announcement for evacuation to this side happened, we were there when it, you know, in the early part of the morning while the mountain was doing a lot of things around us. So we were not responding to the rhythm and beat of the time of the volcano. We were looking to God for that rhythm and beat. And then, um, additional to the praying for guidance and strength, I need to highlight the fact that I have found from my research that religious coping is a major way of coping that was utilized by Mons Russians. And I've written a lot about that. God Talk in Disaster is one of the, art, the journal articles that I've written, which interestingly have become very popular in um, theological studies because disasters are so constant now, whether man-made or um, natural, that the, the you know disaster studies is including in a lot of courses. So ignoring the problem in the hope that is it will go away is another way that we have cope. Some people just sat down and decided, but volcano is not going to do anything, and they, you couldn't get them to to evacuate. You couldn't get them to make decisions to move on. But that was a way of coping. Distracting yourself by watching television, eating. I used to do a lot of that. I loved ice cream at that time. I must have my ice cream. The evening when we were evacuating from Plymouth, I was found, when other peoples were heading north, I was actually found wandering, looking for a tub of haagen ice cream. Because as far as I'm concerned, I would not survive unless I had that ice cream. So I bought myself a big tub for $25, and I bought a tub for the other people in the house. So they could have that, and I had to have my haagen -Dazs. When I finished eating it, I said that um, if the volcano erupted that night, I would have had my haagen -Dazs. And part of what was happening is that I was actually anesthetizing my you know, my emotions so that I could settle down and sleep. But um, a lot of people did that. Parents were complaining that they needed to put a lock on the refrigerator because children were just eating and eating and eating, you see. And then some people didn't eat, but they had sex and, um, and had plenty of it. And, so, you know, and we had examples of people going back into the, uh, into the, Mr. Hogan, don't interrupt me. <laughs> people, I mean, he's whispering with James about what they were up to then. But people went back into the unsafe zone because privacy was denied in the shelters to, to, to ensure that they had some sex. Um, these are all normal ways of responding in a situation like this. And there was a lot of dancing and there was a lot of singing and all of these other things that are about distracting yourself from the reality of what is happening around you. And then some people spend time building up themselves to expect the worst. So, you know, they, their talk would always be about the worst thing that could happen. I remember doing a workshop with the Ministry of Health and the, the mountain was having a good time at, the, at that time and um, really drumming up a beat. 
And there was one member of staff who refused to come into the room where the workshop was coming, was happening, because as far as he knew, the worst was going to happen, and he wanted to see the first signals of it so that he could run. And the mountain did not disappoint him, because when we got to about 3 o'clock that afternoon, he rushed inside and he said, you know, the thing is happening. And the radio was telling us that we needed to move, and I lost half the people in my workshop who decided that they had to run and look for family members and look for children and all sorts. The rest of us who stayed, you won't believe what we did. The colleague who had come in to, to um, do the workshop with me came in from Jamaica, and it was his 40th birthday. So guess what we did? We sang happy birthday, and there was a cake. And we, we sat and we ate the cake all before we made the decisions to go for safety, you know. A lot of that stuff was happening. This is about, um, this is about coping. Okay. So they claim that emotion-focused coping is not as effective as problem-focused coping. But I would say that if you're doing a mixture of the two, that would have helped, and I think that we were doing a mixture of the two. There are some people who are more predisposed because that's how they are towards coping in one way or the other, and they would have been like that before any crisis anyway. Okay? So I would say then that um, monstration ways of coping uh, with catastrophe they are culture-based. And although I spoke about, about um, Hagen's Daz, and I would not say that is, you know, monstration ice cream, um, if I could have got Kenny, I would have had, you know, I would have done better, but I couldn't get no Kenny ice cream, so Hagen's Daz was packaged, and I had that. So monstrous ways of coping are culture-based. And I would say that they're influenced, and I'm saying something now that might be um, regarded as outrageous, but I had a lecturer who told me, do something outrageous, a little Scottish man. So I, have no, I don't think I've let him down, because the last time I spoke for St. Patrick's for the, in this lecture, I decided that they needed to abolish the, the, the naming of it, St. Patrick's, and call it Heroes Day. And some people up to now are still vexed with me for that. But we need to do something outrageous. Um, say something outrageous if we are engaging in academic pursuits. And so I'm bringing it back now. The Jambi dance influences our way of coping. Jambi dance and masquerade rituals. They approximate the social situation in Montserrat at critical points of our history. And I am, in saying that, I have to choose a view of culture which fits that. And I would say that culture, is, as I'm seeing it, is um, borrowed from Maurice Merleau-Ponty. It's a collective lived body, the scars of its experiences accumulated over generations and fixed into rituals and more. So, our experience of enslavement, our experience of, of, of rising up against um, the oppression of slavery on March 17, all the post-emancipation challenges that we've had, all mixed in with the volcanic eruption, have given us a way of coping that is that has been carved out by those lived experiences. So the Jambi dance as a means of coping, there's a Catholic priest, anthropologist, Dobbins, who came and observed the rituals here in 1985. He concluded that the Jambi dance, that folk religion, that it functions as a reservoir of Montserratian culture and as a factor in Montserratian cultural identity. And he said that he knew of no other single event on the island that brings together at one place and time so much of the culture 
and historical heritage of Montserrat. He thought that the Jambi dance symbols show themselves to be dramatic enactments of social relations and problems. When the dominant symbol, the Jambi, is seen as the focus of such a social drama, the nature of the dance is clear. There's no devil worship here, but there's definitely expression of the bond with past and present kin. And within coping with disaster, there is a thing about social support, perceived social support, knowing that if you need you know, to draw on the resources of others around you to survive, that it would be there. And part of what is embodied in the Jambi dance is the fact that kin get together to ensure that a person who is struggling with a challenge receives some form of healing. I'm not going into the details of how the healing happened. I'm extracting from it the thing that is significant to our understanding of the way we cope. And throughout that period, early period of the volcanic eruption, there was a lot of talk about the fact that we are one. We do not allow each other's pots to burn. I will not allow each other's pot to burn. We are a pumpkin runner people, you know. We are connected and we will look out for each other. When that support was not given there was a lot of distress. People became very disappointed when their expectations were not met to the point of despair and depression. So we must look within the culture, cultural expressions that we have to find out the things that we did in order to survive, which is conveyed through them. And so the Jambi dance, as Dobbin declared, it, will, it, is a create, it, is, um, it is creativity born of opposition, resistance, and perhaps even rebellion. So it happened in secret, mainly because the um, part of it, Obia, is outlawed. But Within it, the coping mechanism of resistance is very, very evident, as is evident in our behaviors. They, you know, half of the people may have left Montserrat, but there was another half who said, we are not going anywhere. We are going to die with this island. They will have to drug us screaming and kicking and screaming, and we are still not going. Let the mountain cover us. And so now, as a result of that, the community continued. That was a coping mechanism that is born of opposition and find its um, base in the Jambi dance. Imprisonment, fines, floggings could not stop it. People continued to do it, but it disappeared with modernization. And I, I think it's important for that to be recognized, because in a pre-scientific period of our development, the Jambi dance was providing what was not available in terms of health services and other um, organizational structures. And certainly, there were no counselors, as is known in the Western sense that we are embracing today. So that's what happened. Psychotherapy was being done through the, the, through the Jambi dance. Um, so the Jambi dance rituals enacted privately and the public performances, because that's what I learned recently. Jambi dance happened in private and women danced it mainly. And then the masquerade had the same rhythm, the same beat, the same quadrilles, but it is done in a public way. And in that way, and it's done in, on, on a, in the public arena, and men dance it. Men are the ones, 
it's men who dance masquerade, as opposed to the women who mainly danced, did the drumby dance. Uh -huh. So I haven't gotten into the depths of that yet, but I think that it, it's an area that needs to be um, explored. So I would say that the masquerade and the jumbo dance, they are problem and emotion focused coping strategies rooted in monstration values, attitudes, worldviews about dealing with catastrophe. And just to give you a little insight into what is there in terms of the jumbo dance, um, well, it's a folk religion and folk religions like these exist right across the African diaspora in, in the West. And it provides social support. There's trans dancing, which is included in, some, in, 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 in therapy nowadays um, as a not unusual thing. There's divination, herbs are involved, and we know that healing is involved and connection with the ancestors, which was a means of keeping in touch with the African reality, the connection with the African family, and also keeping the, the, be, the belief that the family does not only exist in present time, but it exists um, according to the ancestors who prepared the way before we came. That idea still exists, although the church was vigorous in stamping out the jumbi dance. It emerges even in the, um, it emerges in the conversation of people who are claiming to be very steeped in the, um, the, pent the um, Western styled religions. So when the drummers change their beat, the dancers must also change their step. The jumbi dance was fine when we were not aware of a lot of the modern day ideas about health and healing. And so things have changed. The, step, the beat has changed and we move on to something else. So now the masquerade is the thing that we are using a lot. It is there all around us once upon when I knew myself first, it was a thing that happened at Christmas time, but now it is happening every, you know, all times of the year. It's out there. And we are seeing it as a stage performance that is benign. But again, within the masquerade, there are coping strategies that we need to recognize. Okay. So under the heading of culture as a mechanism of coping, we have there, you know, the masquerade coming into, uh, um, actually processing into a, into a yard. And so in the masquerade, there are rights of reversal, uh, role, role, rights of reversal, role reversals. You have, first of all, men playing women's parts. You have captain, you have queen, you have um, mate, you have warrior. And when you consider under enslavement, these parts were being played by people who had no power in the usual day. But when it comes to the time when they are um, performing as masquerades, they became powerful. They were leading. They were as captains, as mates, as queen, as warrior. And those role reversals were very evident in our coping with the eruption. There are people who in the ordinary, um, in their ordinary everyday life before the volcano, who just existed in, you know, without any very much presence. But since the volcanic eruption, they have gone on to do amazing things, having tapped into their um, to use the cliche, into their captain, mate, and queen, and warrior uh, parts. And then the other part of it is the signifying. And the greeting march of the masquerade 
is a good example of that, where there's all of the bowing and the, you know, giving respect and the bowing and the giving respect. And I'm calling this an example of signifying in that what is happening is that the, within an, 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 an atmosphere of enslavement, you have to bow and scrape. You have to, you have to do that. It might be natural for you to be courteous, but you are bowing and scraping because that is going to give, gain you entrance into the presence of the masters, the oppressors. And we have kept that up in that we have, we do a lot of that, you know, in order to get in, to, in order to survive. So I say that part of the signifying is that, um, signifying I would, I would explain as, um, you know, things happening on the surface, but the real thing that is going on is not known. So that's why I'm calling it a little bit of puppy showing. We're doing it for fun. There's a song which says that, okay? There's a lot of that that happens. But in studying the masquerade, and I think I saw one of the young men here who I watch dancing, in studying it, there's a military march that goes with that greeting march. And there is a military thing that is actually happening in the movement and the bowing and the scraping. An African military thing. Very much like the capoeira tradition in Brazil, the um, ma African martial art, where the, the arm movements, the slow arm movements, are actually a very powerful military movement in the African sense. So what was happening is that the European military march, John Brown's body and so on, was used as a cover for expressing the power that was taken away as a result of enslavement in this, you know, by doing this dance. Uh -huh. So the power taken away by enslavement was actually generated again in that greeting march. Well, that's what, how I'm trying to interpret it, having studied the movements and making some comparisons with um, the dance elsewhere. So, um, the other part of it, that same movement, is what I would call a Nancyfication. And some people here might, in the audience, the younger ones, might not have been brought up on a Nancy and knowing how clever a Nancy is, the spider that, you know, um, Kwako Nancy based in Ghanaian tradition. So a Nancy knows how to do everything to ensure that he gets where he wants to go and get what he needs. You know, he's that wise trickster. So part of it, I said that is puppy showing, but another part of it is that it is a nancification, you see, because we know that we have to survive. And having, um, um, after rising up in March, on March 17, 1768, I think that most of our people would have understood that they needed to behave in this way in order to survive. The question is whether we need to be continuing in the puppy showing, um, you know, tradition, or should we be anansifying? Okay. There's a lot of mimicking also in the masquerade, and uh, the mimicking of step, step, the quadrilles. They are they are mimicking, and that's why we sometimes are saying that the masquerade is Irish because there's the mimicking of those. Um, 18th century dance steps that were popular everywhere, you see. And of course, it's a good thing, you know, as far as survival to mimic, you know, you are actually entering the cultural space of the, 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 um, the enslavers. Then I mentioned already the warrior. Um, there is a queen within the masquerade, um, so the, the regality um, is of the African person is sustained within that because there's evidence that 
some of the people who were brought were actually of royal households. And so this is a continuation of playing the royal card. The masquerade has leadership. Um, you know, as leadership through its captain, which trains us people to be, you know, who are involved to be leaders. And then it is a clear, a clear structure. You know, it's not an arm. Um, it's not just a free for all, although you have people who might follow the masquerade and do some of that free for all. So I'm saying that within all of this experience, there are um, strategies for coping that we use in our everyday life. Even those of us who are not dancing masquerade, the masquerade is etched into our consciousness. And that gives us um, an insight into dance as a means of coping. Remember that the tune uh, that we're dancing to is the tune of the volcano. And Cicero says that nobody dances when he, he's sober, unless, of course, he's crazy. <laughs> but I'm saying that nobody dances when he or she is sober, unless in pursuit of freedom from oppression, which is what happened in um, March 1768, and um, or there's something happening in the environment as we witness or experience with the volcanic eruption. And these are, well, you know masquerades, but I'm just showing off the women masquerade. Okay, we're marching out. Talk about role reversal. Women don't normally dance masquerade, but in, the, in, this, in this century, women decide they could do whatever they like, you see. And so, we, are, we have reversed the roles there, as you know, of men being captain and warriors and so on in the masquerade. And we, we you know, as women, we are in there. In the usual masquerade, it's only the queen that is sometimes a woman, but even the queen is played by men. And they, they dress up in women's clothes, you know, you see that? They, they, the men dress up in women's clothes. Talk about role reversal. No, these are women dressed up in women's clothes, but men wear the same, the same costume. And I see masquerades, they're, masqueraders, they're laughing, okay? So Cicero might be right. It's only if you're, um, <laughs> you're crazy that you dance, because it takes, you know, um, it's, it's, so you, you, you can reverse roles. So, but to dance is to be out of yourself, to be larger, more beautiful, more powerful. And again, this tells us about the masquerade as a coping mechanism and the jumbie dance as a coping mechanism. Um, so, I'm seeing culture as a mechanism for coping with catastrophe, and um, we continue. These are just pictures to give you the idea of dance as being out of yourself and large and more beautiful, more powerful. And dance is the purest capture through which the soul speaks. Certainly an emotion-focused um, way of coping and um, we are seeing that it has spiritual significance as well. I can't resist the Jamaica <laughs> dance theater because they have done so much work with regards to, um, that relates to the type of discussion that I am having because their performance was about actually mirroring all that was happening in, in, the, in Jamaican society, in Jamaican culture. So we continue, and we, I, I explained this um, before, the um, signifying, the anansification. This is the greeting march, the bowing and the scraping, uh, you see. And um, so we continue. So this is signifying as well, you know. Right now, there are black rep leprechauns as well. We are puppy showing around this thing of Irishness, or are we puppy showing? Is it something, is it an identity that, that we are taking on? Or is it just signification? It could be regarded as signification. We wouldn't know what it is unless we do a little research to find out what is happening in people's minds with respect to this. But the language of leprechaun is, has suddenly descended on, into Montserratian language. Uh -huh. So there, there are young people who are talking about it. Our young philosophers are talking about it. So from trials, 
the village that I come from, a man called Easy Bongo has an opinion about this. And he said, it is amazing how monstrations after a failed slave revolt can turn around and mock the Irish with St. Patrick's Day activities. I find it unsurprisingly amusing and fitting the black leprechauns and the pot of gold as gold as coal. It is a bold statement to the European powers, we cannot be conquered. They have just been outsmarted. <laughs> Talk about anansification. Uh -huh. So we have young people who are thinking this through. Um, I mentioned the role reversal there and the fact that we have women dancing as masquerades now. Uniting and dignifying. The fact that the masquerade is about uniting and giving dignity to oppressed people is very evident. And so despite all that has happened, whatever the volcano has taken, monstrations continue to operate within that dignifying um, tradition. And some people argue that we are, use, we are losing it, but it also gives us the opportunity to recognize that we need to pull it back. And the mimicking, the, the quadrilles. And uh, the quadrilles, to me, the dance of the quadrilles is just a mask. Again, giving opportunity for African people who were enslaved and oppressed to be out on a public stage doing an African thing, but cover under the cover of European quadrilles. Because the movements have to continue to be African. The people who are doing them are African. And so I've got my, my leprechaun again. This time I claim that he's mimicking. And then there's the warrior spirit. And if you ever hear one of our, um, you know, the, our women who know how to cuss well, cuss you will know something about what that warrior spirit is as far as women are concerned. Before you know it, you are doing the thing that you said you would never do, you see. And uh, the warrior spirit caused us to also hold out where others are claiming that um, this is what we need to do. We, we hold out against it. Of course, there are good and there is bad in that. And so we are moving on. And self-help, that is another part of the tradition that we have as Mons Russian. And I've written about stress, uh, in fact, stress busing in the Mons volcanic experience. And I wrote about that based on something that happened within the public service here. Without the presence of counselors and all the other um, personnel that, they, that folks are saying that you must have if you're to cope with the disaster. None of this was evident in Montserrat. And the work that I did on the street was voluntary. It was not paid for. So people were managing themselves. And here you had a set of public servants who came up with their stress busters. And once a week, they pooled their resources around food. Mr. West, you're part of it? OK. All right, they had entertainment. Mr. West would have been doing a little bit of joke telling and puppy showing. All of these strategies came together in the stretch busters. In other words, part of the coping was also the creating of interventions, self-help interventions. And I find it really interesting that I came across something out of Rwanda and its experience of that um, terrible uh, um, genocide. And afterwards, the Rwanda, some Rwanda speaking to a, a, a Western writer said that the people, the counselors who came, because they say you need counselors, they keep on saying you need counselors. And some people are saying that right now, we are hurting and therefore we need to go through these healing things with counselors. And my research, in my research here, People said, I don't want no counselors. And if you're having it, it must be called something else, not counseling. Uh -huh. Other people in other parts of the world, in England it happened after the Hillsborough disaster 
after Abba Fan and so on. People don't want no counselors. They want to sit at home with a cup of tea and their kitten kin talking things through. So these Rwandans are saying, like people in Montserrat and elsewhere, that the, 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 the Western practitioners came and uh, <laughs> they did not in, they, what they did did not involve being outside in the sun where you begin to feel better. There was no music, no drumming to get your blood flowing again. There was no sense that everyone had taken the day off so that the entire community could come together to try to lift up and bring you back to joy, which is what distress busing is. Instead, there was no acknowledgement of depression as something invasive and external that could actually be cast out again. Instead, they would take people one at a time into these dingy little rooms and have them sit around for an hour or so and talk about bad things that happened to them. We had to ask them to leave. And I think that, you know, in our situation here in Montserrat, we have to know when to do that because we get advice from a lot of different sources, sometimes creating the wheel that we have already invented or using the wheel that we have created to teach us again and sometimes very inappropriately. So here you have them doing the thing that they wanted to do which led to their healing, which is part of what we have done in Montserrat. And part of the self-help thing is the maroon tradition that we have, where we help each other out, providing labor and so forth. It happened a lot when we were rebuilding of houses in England, when people were doing up the, the, the apartments that they just got, we, you know, we pooled and we helped each other. And I mentioned the idea of received and perceived, received, perceived and, re and received support, where because of how closely bonded we are, as described from the Jumbi dance and the masquerade, we are expecting that we would be supported. When it doesn't happen, it leads to um, depression. <coughs> Coping um, with catastrophe, I see commemoration as a means of coping. Despite all that happened, we had to have our Christmas festival. Did you remember, do you remember Galvanized Village after Hurricane Hugo? Uh -huh. And all the, you know, during the, the volcanic crisis, we had to have our Christmas festival. Well, I've given a little insight into the history of why that um, period at the end of the year was so important because it's the, the, the three days that we, that our enslaved ancestors were allowed to have a good time. They were given ritual license to enjoy themselves, hence the masquerades on the street and so on. So we are trying. Psychologically, we are. We have that ancestral memory which tells us that we have to preserve that. So the Christmas thing, and uh, of course, the allied with the Christmas was the Jumbi or ancestral table where we were actually trying to keep very present our um, relatives who have passed and who have contributed to us. And some people would say that it's about dealing with the dead, but they, they're, dead, they're dead, you know, so you can't be dealing with the dead. You're dealing with the memory, which, which happens in every culture, you know, keeping in touch, commemorating those who have passed before us. Uh -huh. Then the March 17 celebration. That again is another act of commemoration and you know, we, we are at this time based on things that Ms. Kasloff said actually questioning what are we commemorating. The Calabash Festival I learned was another festival that was brought in because there was concern about the culture disappearing with all the movements of people out and the new people coming in, you see. And then the, the festival of the word, the Aligana festival of the word, trying to bring us back into our storytelling um, heritage. And the family reunions, all of these things, commemorations as a way of coping. Um, and the, through these um, commemorations, there's opportunity for reenactments, for storytelling, kin support, puppy showing, singing, dancing, etc. If we move on, I mentioned that religious coping 
was very evident. And uh, it's interesting that Dobbings, in speaking about the masquerade, acknowledged too that the folk tradition, the folk religious tradition of the Jambi dance is about religious coping. Then we coped, problem focus by evacuating. Then there's education, and many people who evacuated to England, people who would never have gone to a college before, uh, and well, perhaps by the by nature of the, f that, of the fact that they needed to be, to have new skills, so survive within that new context, they became involved in education. A lot of people had lots of, got, um, training and degrees that they would not have had if they were here and probably one would not have been motivated to do so if it wasn't for the fact that their lives were turned upside down. So that was a means of coping. And uh, material acquisitions, buying up plenty clothes, plenty, you know, um, building bigger and better houses, although we've lost and so on, that is part of how we've been coping. And, as with all of the things that I've mentioned, there's good and bad in it. And then returning home for holidays, I heard um, a senior official in Montserrat, I should say I heard a governor saying, I can't understand why these Montserratians are always coming back down here like this so fast. That was at the height of the crisis because before you could look around, people were just coming and going and coming and going. And that was part of it was a coping mechanism. Now you're not seeing as rapid a movement to and fro. And then some people com coming home is that because they might not be managing within, they are managing, but somehow um, psychologically there's a pull to coming back. Then honoring each other. Have you noticed the number of honors that everybody gives honors? Uh huh. Apart from the official one, anybody, everybody um, uh, giving out honors. You know, we are saying, we are saying that we are appreciating. We are appreciating, and probably we are appreciating even more and more because we recognize how easy it is to be separated and for people to, 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 to be lost because many deaths have happened, probably not directly, to, uh, not directly as a result of volcanic action but as a result of the stress and, and the upheaval that, that people have um, experienced. So we're moving on, we're moving on. Um, I mentioned that emotion focus thing about the alcohol, the food, etc. Then sabotage. They claim that somebody revealed the plot about, um, about the uprising of 1768. They say it's a woman. I don't believe them. They'll have to find the evidence. And I haven't seen the evidence yet, you know. <laughs> but that's a, that was an act of sabotage. And I heard Professor Nettleford say that there's one thing you can rely on the Caribbean people to do is to sabotage things. We could make things not work, you know. And we continue to do that. It's a coping mechanism which we developed at a particular time, but it might not be as appropriate now, and we continue to do it. We sabotage ourselves, we sabotage each other's other. Not good for development, is it, Mr. Hogan? Right. And protests, okay? Um, that is all part of it. There was a lot of protesting at the height of the crisis. You know, they, there were people out in sailing, burning motor tires and marching, and, and people were marching, in, you know, and in England, I certainly was asked to go and march on the House of Commons. Not that I, I didn't do that because I didn't think it was appropriate, but people had a sense of entitlement which they thought they were not getting and which they thought that they needed to protest about. Monstrations are not unusual in this respect. This is what happens everywhere when there, there's catastrophe. Then coming up, the beat has changed and we are moving on. And there's this thing about Caribbean unity. As a result of the displacement of our people, we have had to ask people into our society. So now there's an emerging multiculturalism. Um, our Caribbean brothers and sisters are here. And I, I like Professor Netford. So he said that one uni unifying force in the Caribbean heritage is undoubtedly the African presence. So we have that in common, and that's why it's so easy for us to um, pull on the, 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 the human resources uh, elsewhere in the Caribbean. 
we may as well admit to us the great moral strength that would accrue to Caribbean civilization were we to eschew once and for all the lingering plantation and colonial assumptions about the natural inferiority of those of its inhabitants who carry the stain of Africa in their blood. And that's an issue that we, we, we uh, deal, continue to deal with. And our leprechaun has come back at, again. And this time, you know, because we, we have reached this state, um, we are dancing to the rhythms and beat of uh, multiculturalism, how we identify ourselves is, in, is important. So when the drummers change their beat, the dancers must also change their steps. So we are into feral, which is an international happy thing, you know, and um, we need to change our steps. So at this time, when we are changing our steps, there are quite a lot of, um, I hear anecdotally, views of resilience of monstrations um, that comes as a result of the way we've handled the volcanic eruption over 20 years. And sometimes when I hear that view, I cringe because resilience, although it is about coping, it's about managing the situation. Sometimes we might be managing it in a way that is detrimental to us. And that is why I was relating all of those things, relating to the culture, so that we could see how some of those things might have been appropriate at that time, but might not be as appropriate in this time. Um, and then their views also that we are now coping and they, there's a need for healing. Uh -huh. And the question is, what is that need for healing from? Is it from the volcanic eruption or is it from the, um, the embodied, but embodied um, experiences of catastrophe over the 400 years of existence that we have here? And Professor Hilary Beckles have been leading the charge um, for reparation based on the fact that he believes, he's saying there's an assumption that we have been so traumatized that it has a, it's affecting not only our mental health, our physical health, and our all-round development. And so we deserve to be compensated for what happened to our ancestors because that experience, that memory lingers within us and is affecting us in the present time. These are things that are up for debate. So some forms of coping could prove negative or inappropriate according to its, uh, its purpose and its timing. So when does resilience mean that we are still carrying the burden of coping with the devastation of enslavement and the crushing defeat of March 17th? 1768. And when does resilience mean that we are holding on tight and not giving way or embracing our change, our change, changing world over the 20 years of the volcanic eruption? When do we give up the, t the type of resistance that sabotages our health and progress? When do we give up sabotaging, masking, mimicking, puppy showing? When do we become ourselves again? And this is almost um, like a list of just wondering. But what does the self look like when we are not engaged in what Cornel West refers to as hoping on the, type, tight, um, on the tight rope of catastrophe? When do we recognize rhythm and be change? So moving from adversity to resilience is a function of character or culture. Is, that, is it a function of character or culture? So why are some people broken by catastrophe while others endure it? If it is um, a function of, of character and of culture, why is it that within the same culture some people are broken by it and some people are not? And Rachel Yehuda, professor of psychiatry and neuroscience at Mount Sinai in the state, suggested that there's a possible link between biology, history, and culture that determines coping and resilience. And the, he, the, she's done research which, claim, which, which confirms the biological thing. And um, moving on very swiftly, 
Um, this gives us some insight into why some will get post-traumatic stress, that invisible disease that affects so much of what we do and is often not recognized. And there's a thing that some people are writing about, uh, post-slavery stress disorder as well, which is linked to the traumatization of the, from that period. Manchashans, like all other human beings, know how to cope with catastrophe. The type and meaning of coping is peculiar to biological factors, the environmental context, that is the history, culture, and the size of the island. You know, are the things that are peculiar to Montserrat because we are so small. We are certainly tightly knit, reliant on kin um, support a lot. Walking the tightrope of coping may have negative health outcomes. We need to acknowledge that. And we need to acknowledge that researching of these observations, because I am, although I've done some research, I'm, some of what I'm saying, I still regard them as observation, that are observations um, that I need of research. Uh -huh. And what did I say? Researching of these observations needed as a stamping masquerade step, because that's part of what the masquerade is about. The assertive presence of the masquerade, the stamping out, the actual tapping out in a drum-like way of the, the power of the person. So we need that type of commitment to the researching of these observations. I've been trying to beg for that. I've been begging for that for over 15 years and have not had much luck because it is not regarded as priority. But if we are concerned about the health and healing of our people and about the preservation of our culture, we need to do something about it. And that's where I end. Thank you very much. You see, you see, you see the power in the movements the under the under the um the, <laughs> the warrior inside there. Thank you very much, um, uh, Doctor Professor Doctor Clarice Barnes. You have brought us from um, National Heroes Day to uh, a current reminiscing on on where we have come through, not only 400 years but especially your focus on the last 20. And I think you have made a real powerful point about what thinking we need to have now on the interventions for framing our own development, education, and healing.